Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Welcome aboard a Captain's Mindset podcast where we believe that everyone has the potential to become the captain of their own life. I'm your host, Kyle Freiberger, and after spending the majority of my life in the pursuit of becoming an airline captain, I realized that true happiness and satisfaction came from something much deeper than career success. At the age of 34, I took a leap of faith, left my perfect job to become an entrepreneur. This podcast is my way of helping people who feel stuck in life or even those who have achieved success but still feel unfulfilled. Together, we'll explore how to become the captain of your own life and a better leader for the people around you. I'm not perfect and I don't pretend to be. That's why this podcast is filled not only with my life lessons, but also with insights from other successful leaders in business and in everyday life. My goal is to help you unlock your potential and create a positive impact on the world around you. So buckle up and get ready to take control of your life. If you find value in this podcast, please subscribe and share it with other like-minded individuals. Thank you for joining me and I hope you enjoy this episode of the Captain's Mindset Podcast. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Captain's Mindset Podcast. Uh, I'm here with a family friend, longtime family friend, successful entrepreneur, uh, owner and CEO of the Tire Discounter Group, Mr. Frank Brundle. Frank, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Good morning. Welcome to be here. Uh, so you just spent a few weeks down in Florida, and uh, now you're back in the snow to, uh, you said, a sales <laughs> meeting this week. Um, yeah. So we're going to jump into all sorts of different questions around uh, leadership. Uh, Frank is a second generation. His dad started the business in 1966. Uh, you're a father of three, you're a loving husband. Um, so <laughs> right out of the gate, how do you how do you balance it all, Frank? It's hard. Um, when the kids were younger, of course, me and my wife met, we have uh, three girls uh, now. Uh, the oldest is 26 and I'm lucky to have a five month old granddaughter, which is awesome. Um, my middle one's 21. My baby is uh, 19 years old. So look now, they're kind of all on their own and they're doing stuff. The ones in, uh, of course, in their second year university, the other two are on their own doing their own thing, which is good. Looking back uh, when they were younger, yeah, it was a lot of hard work. Back in the day, we did a lot of retail stuff. So it's uh, Monday to Friday, um, whatever, seven o'clock till six at night and Saturdays, most Saturdays started at seven o'clock in the morning, went till noon or to two or three or four o'clock in the mor- in the afternoon, depending on how busy time is. But you always got to try to make time for your family. Of course it is. If you just work, 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 and you don't make time for your family, you got to be as a father, you chose to have children. So you got to look after them. So we always did family trips, uh, try to be at home most nights for dinner. Uh, in the busy time, it's hard, but always spent family day with them and, or family time with them on Sundays and stuff like that. So it's a hard work-life balance because, again, you want to be more successful so you can buy, instead of going to Niagara Falls for a vacation, you want to go to Florida for a vacation. Then you want to go to Mexico for a vacation. So you always want to do more and more. So, I, you know, it's, it's good with my, my wife. She's very fortunate. We got to, she stayed at home with the kids, so she nurtured them and did stuff like that with them at home, which was great. So it is. That, the work-life family balance it is difficult, but we put that in all of our staff now. You need to have your time off. You need to spend time with family time. I like working hard, but you got to play hard and also be time with your family as well. It's very important to us. That's uh, that's great because that, that was kind of my next question. Uh, like, you know, how do you help your employees to make sure that they have that work life balance? And sorry, see, now how we do stuff now is different how we did it five years ago and how you did it yeah. 20 years ago. The one thing that we're looking at now and the one thing that kind of jumped out as mostly is this COVID. If you're not adapting to change in any business, you're going to fail. But you have to adapt to change in your family business, in your corporate business, in your personal life, in your banking, in your structure. Everything's changing. Like the business, everything's changing dramatically. So if I look at it now, yeah, now I'm, I got proper people in place. We got about 180 to 200 people working for us full time. We do have some other part time stuff We're in the tire business. So in the fall, we do quite a bit of more business. So we have to bring in probably another. 30 to 80 people to help us in the in the fall time for the crunch. But now I got proper people in place, get people to delegate and do that stuff. So now I can spend more family time. Where if the Tuesday afternoon, hey, dad, do you want to go golfing? Or hey, dad, do you want to go shopping? Or hey, can we do this or this? Or with friends? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's good. Because again, you need to have the work, your family, but also your friend stuff. So you got your own personal time. Correct me if I'm wrong, but you were kind of using that as like a, like a hard kind of uh, standard in your life to keep you some sort of work-life balance like how how do you how did you manage that is there any sort of 
a book that you read or advice that you got? Any anything to help you with your work life balance? If I look at the work life balance, any books I read or podcast or any audio books I listen to, um, nothing really screams out at me. But again, if you look at it, talk to people older. You know, my dad when he got sick a few years ago, he said, "I wish I spent more time with you guys. I wish I was there for you guys more." I'm like, my dad, we talked, we had a cottage up north. We had a place down in Florida. We spent lots of time, but just more or less, that thing is just more or less uh, maturing. Like you talk to other people, it's nice to work, but if you go to your grave site with a hundred dollars or with a hundred million dollars, you're still going to your grave site. So yeah. not to get too sentimental on that sort of stuff, but you know, if you spend time with your kids and your friends, it's so important because once you get older and you're retired, you've got nothing to do it. So if any books, they said the only thing, and same with my staff, like we work here, my guys work very hard and my girls work here very hard. But if I'm going home at quarter after five or five thirty, I see people still in the office. I'm like, what are you doing here? Get out of here. Go home, go home. Or on a Friday of a long weekend, it's two o'clock. Go home. This stuff can wait unless you don't have your work done, of course. But you know, you have to, and they tell everybody, you got to work hard and play harder is the kind of way to do it. But if you don't have a proper family balance, the people are going to come to work, burn out, tired on edge. If you don't have a happy life at home, you're going to come to work. They, everyone says you keep your work here and keep your home life there. It's crap. If you have a crappy work life, you're going to bring it home. If you have a crappy family life, you're going to bring it there. So it's a hard thing to do, but you have to, you have to keep that balance. That's so important. And I love your answer there. There's these seven blue zones around the world. Have you ever heard of these, Frank? The seven blue zones? No. So the blue zones are where the average age is over 100. Um, they live to wow. over 100, the average age of death. And they've studied these blue zones and there's I think there's a, de a Netflix documentary about it as well. And there's been different stuff said, but every all the research that I've read was when it comes to the, the health span or the lifespan of these people, they're not it's not like a special diet. It's not a, a they're all getting a, a lots of exercise. It's 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 actually um, the purpose. It's it's they all it's small communities of people and everybody has their purpose and everybody has their sense of belonging and everybody feels like they're valued and. So it's like a lot of like togetherness. And when we look at like people who or, or human beings in general and like our fundamentals, uh, one of our strong motivators is we want to belong and we want to have that sense of belonging. So it's that whole like, you know, just like you were alluding to, it's kind of bull crap that you're, you know, you keep your, your work life at work and your home life at home. It's it's no it's it's the sense of purpose that's going to drive you and, and help you to do better work. So that brings me to my next question which you kind of already answered, but I want you to talk through that. You said that when people go home and they're spending their time with their family and they're a little bit, you know, a little bit more reset, a little bit more positive, they come back to work. Now they're positive. Now a little more reset. Now they can do better work. Like talk me through how, what kind of environment that creates at work and why that's so important for business. You have to be good. Actually, the one of the book that I did read was called Raving Fans. It's, I think the guy's name is Ken Blanchard that uh, wrote the book. But he's good because if you have people at work and they're happy, it's phenomenal. They work very well. They work harder. So if a person is, is working stressed out, he's been working six months straight or eight months straight without any holidays because he's too busy, can't get away, he won't be as product. A productivity of his job is not going to be there. So if the guy has to take a week off or even a weekend off or a long weekend, just go away reset your batteries, reset your head. It's like, you know, with your phone, you're using your phone also, it's not working slower. What's the first thing they do? Restart your phone. So I say, guys, take a holiday, go do a reset, go restart your phone or go restart your computer. And you're going to feel so much better. You have to be there because that way, when they come back to work, um, they're happy. As I said before, uh, it's like a dog wagging a tail. Like a lot, we, we buy and sell tires around black things. You buy them from wherever you want to. We only sell to just, uh, to, um, other retail consumers, we don't sell the public, but if somebody picks up the phone, I want that person that answering the phone or my sales guys or anybody, like it's a dog wagging a tail. You know, dogs wagging a tail, they're so excited, they're so happy. I want to get that energy when they're on the phone doing that. If they're pissed off or upset about their wife or they're burned out, they're not gonna have that same um, excitement on the phone. So again, you need to take time off. Even go with your boys for, uh, go bowling or go to the bar, have wings and beers or go to the weekend or go to the beach. Just, you need to get that reset just to get your mind clear. Like the, the way I call it, it's just like a reset, restart yeah, your phone. Yeah. yeah. That's a great way of looking at it. And that leads me into another thing that, you know, I've talked about before in the past is, um, 
business and relationships. And I think I asked you this question once before was what, um, uh, I'm trying to think of how I asked it, but your answer was relationships. I think I said, you know, what was, what's the sole, sole reason for the success of your business or, you know, whatever, like, and, and your second generation, we'll get into a little bit about Fred, your dad, your father, and, and how he, you know, led his business to led the, led the business to a certain point and then you took it over. Um, but why is relationships so important in, in the success of a business? You could use relationship as far as your personal life, as far as business. So I'll touch on business first. As far as doing our business, it is relationship with our, our, our salespeople. We don't call them salespeople, we call them business develop managers. So they're helping Bob's garage or Bob's alignment to help get their business and help you better them. So if you got a relationship with your customers, the customer is going to talk to you if they have a problem. There's a study to see if you go in there, hi, I'm John Smith. I'm doing a survey on how you like the entire discounted group. Yep, they're good. They're fine. Okay, thank you very much. Click. That's not a real uh, relationship with you have. If it was a real relationship, yes, Tardis Counter is good because they do this, 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 and this. The problem I got, they're not doing this as good as my competitor, not doing this as good as a competitor. So if you have that relationship built with your customer, you're going to know what his needs are and his wants are. So that way, as a customer and a supplier, you can help better support them on what their true needs are. But you have to dig in and ask them, how's this? It's fine. How's this? It's fine. No, find out what the real problem is. Get to the real heart problem. Fix that. You're going to have a better relationship with your customer. You have a better relationship with your customer. They're going to be loyal like a raving fan. They're going to want to deal with you more. They want to have that support with you. And you said before in that community where they live to 100, they feel wanted, they feel needed, and you want to be a part of that business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, okay. Now, you, now I just want to dig in even more on this whole uh, relationship side because you were talking about how, um, but when you're building a relationship with somebody, let's say your your sales guys or your, um, what do you call them again instead? Business develop managers. BDMs. Business development managers, yeah. So, and I've heard that term before. Uh, you, you talked about them getting a little bit deeper and figuring out what the needs of the customers were. So, Talk me through the feedback in a business and why that's so important. What do you do with your staff, with your company to get that feedback? And how does that help you as in your business? See, for us, it's different because we're business to business, B2B. We're not B2C, business to customers. So we have to make sure we have that relationship built with the customers. We'll kick on Bob's garage again. So my sales, my business development manager has to go there and figure out what Bob wants and needs are. If you got to take them out for lunch, that's good. But I look at his lunch, that's both your own time or that's both the business time. If you really want to get somebody, take them out for a golf game on a, a Saturday afternoon or a day after work or take them out for a dinner evening with his wife and your wife and sit down and figure out what you do and become, I wouldn't say become friends, but become relationship. You're just not an order taker taking the stuff out there. It takes a while to drill down and find out what that customer wants to be and what his true needs are. So it does, it's a lot of work. It's just not walking in. Okay, give me four of these, two of these, eight of these. Okay, see you later, goodbye and leave. Some customers want that. I don't want to be your friend. I don't want to do this. I just got the needs. Here's your pricing. Here you go. Just transactional, customers, right? It is. But some of those customers, it's just, you have nothing. I just want to buy the cheapest tire I can at this price, bring it and sell it and done. But when they have different problems or different warranties or different issues or different specials, there's so many more that goes into business than just buying a round rubber black thing. So you have to really dig down. And it is hard to do. It is. It takes uh, numerous visits. It takes numerous Social calls, you know, we try doing two or three different events for our customers to bring them into our different warehouses across Ontario. It might be like, say, um, I'll pick on Pirelli. It might be a Pirelli night. Okay, tonight's night is brought to you by Pirelli Tires. We're going to bring in. We're going to show you a few new brands that they're carrying, a few new models that they're going to carry. We have these tires on special. Bring them in for a couple snacks, a couple beers. Show them the wheel and deal we got to do. Thank you for business. Let them go on their, on their way home. So you have to think outside the box do something different to do it. Because again, tires, some people, tires is a grudge purchase. Like right now in the winter time we're getting now, oh, I need winter tires, I'm sliding. I don't care, just give me four of the cheapest tires you got or give me, I want to set up, oh, I saw Bridgestone Blizzard. They're the best, they stick dice. Give me four of them. 
businesses are starting to realize if they stick to the transactional side and they're not digging deeper, like you said, uh, there's a higher turnover rate, there's a higher, uh, less customer retention rate. And I think a lot of these statistics, people are looking at them too, um, too mathematically. Uh, and so talk me through why and how that, in, you know, investing into your customer or, or just kind of keep expanding on this investment into your customer because it's not necessarily a financial investment at this point. It's, it's more of a time investment as well. And you said it's very difficult. You have to spend a lot of time doing it. But why why is it so worth it? Like, and, and maybe a better way to ask this question is, you know, your dad started this business in 1966. And I think once I asked you the question, like, why was he so successful? And you talked about the relationship side of it again. So, you know, this business was started in 1966. It got to a certain point. You took over. Now it's, you know, 10x or 100x or whatever it is. It's, it's expanded quite, quite a bit. How much time out of your day do you invest in relationships? I'd say, I don't know what percent. It's a lot. 50, 60 percent, because, again, it's relationship with your customers. It's relationship with your staff. Um, again, if I pick on staff, if you don't treat your, your, your employees well, it takes just, say, two or three or four months to get the, the staff member trained to do the job properly. So it becomes a habit. So they know what they're going to do. If you don't treat them well and you're going through a lot of staff out back, you know, unloading tires, picking tires, putting away tires, shipping tires collecting the money, doing all the different aspects of running a business, the turnover rates, it's going to hard. It's going to kill you. And same thing with your customers. If you got that relationship with your customers, they're going to tell you when something's going wrong or they're going to tell you when pricing's not right or tell you the different issues to have and say, once you retain that, it's just a funner place to, a fun, funner doesn't make sense, but it's a fun place to work. And there's the other thing that was called, I forget the book, it's called the fish market. It's about a, um, a fish market in Seattle. And just these people go in there, they're tired, they're stressed out, they're worked, they're hungover from partying or whatever they do, but they always show up to work. It's an amazing um, book to read. I think they even got a, a video on it. It just shows if you're having fun at work, people want to be around that. You get that energy. People want to thrive to be around you and around your environment because it's fun, it's exciting, it's not boring, it's happiness, it's fun. It's just not like boring, here's your tires, here you go. You can use that in any business. Look if you're selling tennis balls or you sell football equipment or cutting grass. If you got that that fun experience, people want to be around fun stuff. Why wouldn't I want to be a boring and sitting in a uh, stagnant place and being like this? If you asked me before, sorry, the question about my father. My father did start back in, in the day. He did have the relationship where people trusted him. He said back in 1966, he sold gas. Uh, he fixed inner tubes because there was, wasn't tubeless tires back then. Um, so pop and chips did service calls and stuff like that. But as he got bigger and bigger and bigger, he just, you know, people trusted him. Like, here, go, go see Freddie. And I remember when I was younger, people walk in here, Fred, here's my car. I need four uh, winter tires for it. Uh, I'll be back at three o'clock when I'm done work. Or Freddie, what do you recommend? And stuff like that. So once you have the confidence and you know you're not just going to screw somebody, that's probably a bad word for <laughs> or not treat the person properly. Yeah. You get that trust on a retail basis. It's easier because it's a small town. They, we lived in Orangeville. It was good. People trusted Freddie. Go to friends. He'll look after you. Yeah, it becomes more of a legacy at that point. There's a Maxim Gladwell. I don't know if you've ever read any of his stuff with the five levels of leadership. So just speaking through that just reminds me of, of getting to like that fourth, fifth level where it's less about you know, maybe there's a name involved, but it's, you know, people, people want to follow that name because there's a, there's a track record. There's a, there's an element of trust. There's a legacy behind it. And that's when you, you know, really understand that you've got this, this moving vehicle that's less about any one person and more about um, the community of people. Uh, why is it? So you keep talking about this uh, positive, happy work environment. Can you speak to like the growth side? Like, you know, if somebody makes a mistake, like how do you guys deal with it? Uh, how do you keep it positive? Are mistakes okay in your company? That sort of thing. Like how do, what kind of environment, how do you, how do you support um, that growth environment in your, in your company? It's tough. If you make a mistake, a mistake costs time and money for sure. If you ship guy four tires and there's three of one and one of the other one, well, that customer is at the other shop doing it. 
Now the guy has to go back here, get a tire from, our, from one of our DCs, ship in the customer tire, he got that. So all the pure profit's gone. So if a person makes a mistake, get said, okay, you made a mistake, I understand we all make mistakes, there's nothing wrong with that. If people don't make mistakes, I wouldn't say they're not trying hard enough, but you always want to encourage your staff to try more, try more, and not go at that extra level where you're going to tip and break, but encourage your customers and employees to work as hard as they can. So as far as that, there is an issue, explain to the customer, or explain to your staff member, okay, we did this and this wrong because of this, this, this. I'm not going to do shit, I'm just trying to explain to you what you did wrong. If it happens again, you bring the person in and say, listen, we did it this way and this way, did not explain things right the first time. Oh, okay, did this wrong. We can extend the reason why and explain the, the benefits of them doing that wrong, how much it affects other people in the business and it hurts everything. The third time, you got to write the person up. Listen. As far as you did this, I explained this, this, and this, you got to do it. So if the guy's not getting it or he's doing something wrong or he just has some issues on there, you have to give the person some chance. But after the third time now, how the, the legal things and things change with the Employment Act and stuff like that, you have to explain the person. But you do it off to the side. You don't give the guy crap right in front of everybody and make him feel like he's this small. Uh, and really shrink them down. You have to make sure you explain to them what's wrong, how you're going to do it, and if there's issues going on there, get them fixed. If you can't do there's something wrong, maybe he's not the right person for that job. Maybe there's another place, another position he could work for. Ah. Or in the place that make things work. I like that. I, 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 if you focus on trying to be perfect, you're going to spend your whole life being stressed out because there's no such right. thing and you'll never not make a mistake. And if you never make a mistake, then you're definitely not growing or trying hard enough, like you said. So it's like you were kind of speaking about this balance between, okay, you make a mistake. The most important thing is you learn from it. Okay, now we evolve. And, and that's a rational, logical um, path to follow. I think the, the thing that you're speaking well about is where's the balance, right? Like how many times can you make the same mistake before we have to call it insanity? Or how many times do you make the same mistake before in a business we have to make a decision because the business will go under? Or, and, and you even said, maybe there's a different position for this person. And that's this whole idea that we have to accept our flaws and our weaknesses. We can try new things. But, you know, maybe I go and try to be a helicopter pilot and I'm just not as good as I am a, a regular pilot. And, you know, and at some point I have to be like, OK, you know, I'll just stick to being a regular, you know, a, 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 an airline pilot or, you know, if I'm in a business, maybe I'm really good at communication, but I'm not so good at uh, maybe I'm not so good at sales or something and finding your place in that business or finding your place in any business for that matter is is a big challenge for a lot of people. How do you help your employees to find their place or find their or focus on their strengths, improve their weaknesses? How do you how do you keep that going? It is tough. You want to challenge all your employees to work well and do hard. When I talked about earlier about the guy picking tires, right? You know, that's our warehouse uh, guys picking tires. That's like you flying a plane. If you're flying a plane and you don't land right, that's bad. Yeah, if you go on to, I can't pick on flying now because, okay, everybody brings your carry-on. Well, when you get to the last zone, all those carry-ons are going back under the undercarriage. Just you have to work with on how things are doing. But it's in my management team and my purchase team and sales team, as far as we all work together, and again, I'm very, very good. I'd say this is one thing I learned from my father that I changed. Back in the day, my father would make an idea. That's how we're doing it. End discussion. Let's plow forward. He did it. And it was good because once you make a decision, you got to keep doing it. You can't veer off and change that way. He did that decision. Sometime it worked out great. Good. I'll do that again. So I made, made a decision. Oops. That was bad. Might have lost money, bought bad tires, bad sales or whatever. Um, and it wasn't good. Okay, shoot. You got to learn from that mistake and don't do that again. Now in the position that we are now, any decision we make, I talk to my executive team and say, okay, we're going to bring these tires in or go to this area or whatever scenario you're going to do in business. Okay, guys, let's make a decision. See, there's 10 of us in the room and seven of us say yay and at three say no. Okay, the decision is yay. It's unanimous. got to do it. Good. Let's stay focused on this decision we're going to make. But all 10 of us are rowing the same way. It's not like three of us are rowing this way and the other guys are rowing this way. No, we're all going to be rowing the same thing. If it doesn't work out, I don't want the three people to say, oh, I told you so. Just work executive on the team, get things going. Let's find different ways to make it work. And if it's good, great. We'll learn from that. 
If it did bad, let's learn from our mistakes and change on how we're going to do things. I just said the first part of the, uh, we started talking for right now in 2022 and 2023, there's going to be so many changes going on with the interest rate, with um, the pricing of stuff coming in, with the price of ocean freight decreasing, huge coming from China. There's so many different variables going on right now, the housing market. Uh, trying to get people to work. Uh, there's so much stuff going on right now. You have to be able to change. So right now, once you make a decision, as we talked before, stay on that path. If you meant you have to vary a little bit, go a little bit, but don't go way over here on the other way we're going to go. Make your decision. If you have to change your decision, no problem. That's what you see. You have to change, yeah. but you got to stick on the path you're going to go. Yeah, it's funny. I think I think another thing that stands out to me in, in the leadership coaching side of my business is a lot of people think that they have to figure out what the right decision is before they make the decision. But that's counter, uh, it, it doesn't work. It's not rational. Like you don't know if it's the right decision until afterwards. Even if you think you're a hundred percent, you're not because you're saying that that decision is like, it's based upon so many external factors that you can't predict what the outcome of a decision is. As the captain of a ship, the captain of a business, the captain of anything in life, you, you you said it perfectly. You have 10 people, let's say, around you, 10 managers. You get them in a room. You gather the right people, right? In aviation, it's the co-pilot. It's the flight attendants. It's the air traffic control, the maintenance, the dispatch. You collect all of those people. You take your time as long as you have time, which in aviation, 99.9% .9 of the time, you have a, a decent amount of time. And that's the first thing they teach us is like time or no time. No time, it's got to be trained reaction trained reaction you, you practice 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 you know that engine fire that failure on takeoff whatever that is we're trained to react to that but the moment we say we have time now it's like okay now it's an assessment now it's collect as many perspectives as we can as much information as we can go look in the manuals look it up uh don't try and memorize things the company used to even when i first started my aviation career it used to be like you gotta memorize all these things and it's like, well, that's impossible. <laughs> like, I'll try. <laughs> and then I started realizing, no, it's more important that you know where to go to look for it. You know who to go to to look for it. That's the most important thing when you're becoming a leader or, or you are you are a leader or you are a captain or or, and, or even just a husband or a father. Uh, it's, it's collect as much information as you can, make the best decision you can, stick with it, try it, and then assess and learn from it. That's the process, no matter whether the decision's right or wrong or good or bad. It's um, it's that process in which you can find a lot of growth and a lot of success. Going back to a little bit about um, Fred, your father, uh, how he grew the business. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about because obviously there's a, a a lot of evolution, a lot of evolving, a lot of things have changed. What do you, what do you do differently than your father did? And then I want to talk a little bit about that changeover from first generation to second generation. It, yeah, but to answer what you talked about before, people analyze, analyze. The way I look at it, if you go to the racetrack and bet on the horse, you look at the program, you look at all the stats, where you want to finish, you place your bet. After that, your bet's done. There's nothing you do. It. People get so stressed out after watching the horses going in race. Well, you know, at the quarter, he's there. At the three quarters, you're here. At the half, and you finish there. They stress out a bit. Once you make that bet and you make that purchase, Stop and just watch it go. Yeah. Just kind of like we talked about before. Have you ever read this book? Cyber no. Uh, Psycho Cybernetics. It's funny because literally what you just said, and this is, uh, I'll, 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 I'll speak about it in another analogy just so everybody listening gets this because it's so important. Um, so this book talks about gambling on blackjack. So you have, um, or sorry, not on blackjack, roulette. So on roulette, it's got the wheel with the ball that spins and, and you can, bet on all these different numbers, but you can also just bet on red or black. So when you place your money down on red or black, you're making a decision. Once you place your money down on that color and the ball's spinning and then the, the, the guy that's dealing or the guy that's spinning the ball, uh, he waves it off. He says, okay, no more bets. He's like, most people, like you said, choose to stress more after they make the decision <laughs> than before they do. Right, but it makes no rational sense because you can't change the outcome anymore versus before you put your bet down, that's when you should stress if you wanna stress about something because now you're trying to make a decision. But we all know it's like a 50, it's like a 49, 40, what is it? 49, 49% 49 chance or whatever that you're red or black and then a 1% chance that you get green. Um, so it's like there's odds, 
and you have no idea and you don't know if you made the right decision until after, right? Just like anything else. So yeah. it's, it's think about that when you're trying to make a decision, it's make the decision. And, and there's another quote real quickly, uh, smart people make quick decisions and change their minds slowly versus, uh, let's say un successful people, like successful people do that. Unsuccessful people make slow decisions. They take forever to make a decision and then they keep changing their minds all the time. So, I would agree 100% on that, that method. Decide what you're going to do. It's in your, it's, it's, if, it's, if it's your gut feeling that says it, you're you. You got a gut feeling, you got a heart, you mm -hmm. know how things are going to work, your gut decisions this way. Okay, well, I made the decision. Again, stick to that plan. I think we're both in agreement that stick to that plan, do what you're going to do. Later on, you have to vary a little bit. Okay, but don't go like this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's so true. There's a book I'm reading right now called The Gift of Fear, and it's all about your intuition, your gut feeling. Uh, and it's like, I believe in my gut feeling. And again, talking about that gut feeling really quickly as a side note in aviation towards the end of my career, they were really, really, really starting to stress. Like if you feel like if you have a feeling, don't do it. Like if you have a bad feeling, don't do it. Like as a last line of defense, but it, they, they started understanding and we understand as human beings. Now, um, there's enough psychologists and stuff that have dissected this, that, our gut feeling is actually our unconscious brain telling us something, right? Because we pick up cues, like we pick up thousands, hundreds of thousands of cues all day long, but our conscious brain is only focusing on whatever we want to focus on. Doesn't mean that our unconscious brain isn't soaking up all these other, all these other cues. And that's where our intuition or our gut feeling can come into play big time. Um, and it could definitely save your life. This whole book is all about, um, uh, you know, murders and, and like, uh, bad uh, uh relationships like where a husband kills the wife afterward after they get a restraining or uh you know a, an employee gets fired and he sends a bomb in the mail like uh, people think it's not predictable but it's it's quite predictable actually so mm -hmm. very interesting that let's get back to fred uh fred you're the second generation you and i looked up the statistics a little while ago first to second generation has a 66 uh, percent ish give or take uh success rate uh, third generation was down to like a 30% and then fourth generation is like a 2% chance of success. What, um, what was the hardest part about that transfer f for you or for your dad or for both of you? And what are some lessons that you learned transferring that company or, or that, that, uh, having that generation transfer, I think back in 2012 is, is kind of when you started mm -hmm. taking over. It's a great question. Give me a look back on whenever it goes. It was hard on my, my father. It's hard on myself as well. So I look at kind of back how my dad started a business back in 60. Oh, I was around in 66, but in the 70s, when I come around the shop a bit more in the 80s, you know, he always ran his business with the iron fist. You do it my way, my, my way. He works his suppliers up. I want the best price. I don't care if you make money or lose money. I want this. As far as those, his employees treat him very hard. You got to work here. You don't like it. Get out here and go fire. Be gone. This day and age, you can't do it. If any of it now, whatever the, the the Gen Z or Gen Y is, the younger gens that were out there, they only want to work a, a four day, 30 hour work week. So, how we do stuff now is totally different in the past. Like I with my dad, he always did things on Iron Fish. You do it this way, do it this way. Always looked after the customer. The customer experience was always the best, but just worked all the suppliers hard, worked all your customers hard. Where the way I changed over when I bought the business in 2012, which I was doing a little bit before, is probably once I got a little bit smarter, a bit reading a bit more and understanding more, it has to be a, for as far as supplier, the supplier's got to win, but also I got to win as a, uh, as a wholesaler. So again, mm -hmm. I'm not going to beat them up for the best price. It's got to be fair for you and fair for me. It's got to work a two-way street with our suppliers. The employees, if anything else, I ask employees more. I'm not sure if you can do a read-up, but if you look at employees from one to 10, what's the number one where you want to be? We as owners think number one is money. Uh, number two is make sure you're going to get their benefits. Number three is you're going to get the holidays. You ask your staff that there, I think money came fifth. Uh, the one important, make sure I'm involved with this decision. Let me know where the company is going to go. 
So as far as, uh, again, that's another dialogue. We have a meeting about this later. But if you ask your employees their opinion, make sure your employee is going to have, like we have a, um, about every three to four months before COVID, we sit down with all of our, our employees at each branch and talk about, hey, guys, just so you know, uh, this is a new person working in this department. This new person working here. Uh, this is what TARDIS counter plans are. This is what we want to grow. This is what we want to do and let them know the future of the company. So it makes them feel part of something that's growth and something attainable. So letting the employees know more what's going to go on, letting your customers know more, just being more proactive on what's going to happen. We found that would to be a, a big game changer as far as firing somebody because they didn't look good that day or their hair wasn't combed straight. We can't do that anymore. That's what you say. You got to uh, explain the problem, explain this problem a second time, third time, write them up, a written warning, and maybe the fourth or fifth time, you got to get rid of them. But again, you hired that person. It's hard to get people to work in this environment. In the 2022 was probably 2021 and 22 when COVID was really strong. It was hard to find employees. So you got somebody working here, work your best to make, say, a fun environment stuff to work with them. So if I look at my dad, whenever I took over the business, you're doing it all wrong. I didn't do it that way. You're doing this thing wrong, doing this thing wrong. Yes, dad, I understand what you're saying. And that's when he's starting to get sick. So I couldn't just say, we're doing it my way, get out of it. I say, we're doing this for, you know, try to explain the reasons why we're doing it. Well, that's never going to work. You're going to fail. So it's hard to do it. As far as if, you know, if you think you got a business, it's been a business for 25 years and the second generation comes in there, that's good. They shouldn't have much debt on the building or if they're still renting, they should have bought the building. Um, they should have great relationship with the bank. They should have great uh, a relationship with the suppliers. But when the second generation comes in there, they want to make all these big changes. Or if they have to be on a burner, they got to make changes and change it, hopefully in a good way, not a bad way. Or B, the second generation, well, my dad did it this way, it's not broke, keep going the same way. They keep going the same way and that's going to fail. You have to change with times. And how he did things, like if you look at COVID, a quick side, I know everyone's sick and tired of talking about COVID, but when COVID hit back in 2019, we were having meetings every single day. Rob Ford got up and talked. Okay, we had all our six or eight people at the time came in the boardroom. Okay, what are we going to do for today to make it for tomorrow? Good. Next day, talk. Okay, how are we going to change this? People are calling me, Frank, what are we going to do next month? Next month? I want to know it's Tuesday. What are we going to do on Thursday or Friday? So again, that's how you do that change and you have to roll with that. And then after a while, we, we met weekly, then we met monthly. So again, that whole thing with change and doing that, but you got to be, you know, as far as anything, you have to treat people fair, treat your employees fair, treat your uh, uh, customers fair, treat your suppliers fair. It's got to be a win-win for everybody. It's kind of the best way I can sum that up. Yeah. And, and, and I was going to ask you like that idea of, of, or that word fair, you, you said it kind of right at the end there, like it's got to be a win-win. Like fair yeah. doesn't mean I'm the owner of a business. I think that this is fair. So here's what everybody gets. This should be fair. You should think this is fair. You're my employee. This is this is fair. Um, it has to be. Hey, what do you? Just like you said, I like that exercise. You know, having something. Um, uh, rating it from one to 10 as the employer, you think, okay, well, money's the most important. Yeah. You know, and then you have your list and then you give it to your employee and they think, Oh, time off is the most important thing to me or, or being, you know, being in a positive work environment is the most important thing to me. Uh, it gives you a really good understanding that what you think is fair and what employee thinks is fair, uh, will not be the same. And it's about figuring out that happy medium and, and that balance in between, because like you said, if you don't have, happy, positive, motivated employees, you're just going to have a high turnover. You're going to have, it's just going to be super difficult to, to keep that business going. And, you know, I agree think, 100%. what is, what has been one of your biggest mistakes? And if you were to go back and tell yourself just to, you know, cause again, mistakes are, you, you had to make a decision based upon what you knew at the time you, you know, maybe something didn't work out right, but you took away a huge lesson that you would go back and tell yourself or, or you could share with our listeners. What, what would that be? That's a very tough one. I <laughs> doing. My, my brain is kind of spinning, but to say what you said before, after a week being off, that's just in your breeding. That's Marvin and Angela being your mom and dad. You're not going to sit around. You got to go, go, go. So that's your breeding. You always want to do that. As far as my biggest, I wouldn't say it was the biggest mistake, but the biggest learning obstacle, we opened up a branch a few years ago just thinking this is the best we can do. I think this is going to be very well. 
there's lots of population, lots of people, it's going to work. Uh, we had all the manpower to do it, so it was a good decision to make it. It was good, but if we had researched it and did a bit more what we're doing now, because the way I look at it, if I look at back, uh, we're in 2023 now, if I look back probably five to eight years ago, I was ready, fire, aim. Now in 2020, I'm like, no, okay, that doesn't make any sense. It's ready, <laughs> fire, aim. So now it's ready, aim, fire. Uh, um, so now probably about three, probably a 2019. Okay. Let's look, have a better scope on doing it. So again, what happened years ago, we opened up a new branch. I thought it was going to be good. We had the proper people open up, got the warehouse, got it going. It was good. Warehouse and race wasn't in the right area. Didn't have the proper loading docks, didn't have the proper, um, proper salespeople get things going. So I look back at that, that could have been a mistake, but again, we, we did that. We chose to do it. Uh, and now it's probably one of our best branches to work out of. It worked very well. We had, when we first opened up, we had the best people to do it, but we just we didn't do the research properly on the best location, best products and stuff to get going on. Now I'm happy we did it, but if, to do stuff like that, just research it. I'm not a guy to spend a month or three weeks researching something. If it feels good, as we both agreed, in your gut to make it work, good. Do... Um, maybe two, three, four days or a week and get some more analysts and understand that stuff. Now with the computer and stuff like that, you can get information like at your fingertips. Yeah. yeah but other like, that I made, it was, it, was a, it was a decision. I made it. It's done. It's over. And you carry on. So it's still like, it's hard to call it a, a, a mistake. And it's funny because you even had a hard time calling it a mistake. And, it's, and I asked that question the way I ask it on purpose is because, you know, entrepreneurs, leaders, people who understand this, they have a very hard time saying that word. Well, I don't know if it was a mistake or it's like, but the biggest lesson I learned, right? So and, yeah, it's a mistake. <laughs> well, it's like, you know, but it's, but it's, it's hard to call it a mistake once you learn a lesson from it. It's mistaken kind of makes it a negative connotation. Like it makes it sound negative. It sounds like a bad thing, but you just said like, it turned out to be a great thing because you learned from it, you guys evolved and you're not, you know, now you're sharing that on a podcast so that other people maybe do a little bit more research or depending on the decision you have to make, you know, take a little bit of time. Don't take too much. That balance is completely up to you. Uh, it, it's a balancing act. Right. And, and this is this is not about, hey, for this decision, you know, we're not we're not giving people the uh, the clear uh, roadmap to making a decision because it's not a clear roadmap. It's for every different decision in your life, depending on your experience, might take more or less time. But we are encouraging people to um, push through that fear of being wrong in your decision because mistake is only a mistake if you don't learn from it, right? And uh, right, sort of feel like to keep making the same mistake over and over again—that's bad. That's bad. Learn yes. from your mistake, do it, and don't do it again. That was in my uh, my business career. As far as mistakes I made in my personal life, I look back when I was in my late thirties or early forties. I was one of those guys that was work, work, work. Kids, I'll see you later on. I told you that's my balance right now. But back when I was, you know, late 30s, I wanted to work, work, work. I didn't care. Kids, I'll see you later on. Uh, I just want to work and just go, go, go. Hard on the stop. Let's go. Let's build a business. Let's grow and grow and go. Um, it made things a little bit bad at home. Made it a little bit bad with my friends. My kids noticed it. And just something light went off in the middle of the night or doing something, a light went off and said, boom, listen, Frank, stop, slow down. You don't need that. And then all of a sudden it's like, whoa, went off there. Okay, let's get back and doing things together. And I did that reset. But even when the kids were young, we always went away to someplace for a week or two weeks. You know, we always went away on one or two or three vacations a year somewhere for a weekend or for a week. We always, uh, even when the kids were born and growing up, we always did that. But, you know, that work-life balance, now it's fantastic. I love it. But looking back 15 years ago, I was like, Frank, you're going to, you're going to, I'd be in a heart medication, blood thinners. I'd be in a, a padded wall room. Uh, so you do have to do that. But again, everyone's different. You're going to come to that life in your point where it doesn't, doesn't make sense. It's hard to tell somebody that's 30 years old listening to this. You got to do this, this, this. I can't, I got to work. I got student debt. I want to get a car. I don't have a house. I'm still in my parents' basement. I got to work 60 hours a week to do that. But I only want to work 30. So it's a hard work balance to do. And again, it's, it's a hard decision to do, 
But again, everyone's different. Somebody that light's going to go click and you're going to understand what you're going to do. Yeah, I think a, a good way that I've kind of perceived that is you're 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 trying to work smarter, not harder in the sense of you could paint, you know, as many walls in a day as you could to make money. But if you start to work smarter and you start to think, OK, if I build a relationship with the right people, hire my employees, create a positive environment, they're going to I'm building them up. I'm helping them to create a, a life uh, through uh, financial means for their family. I'm helping them have a purpose of, of whether it's painting or whatever it is. Again, it, it, it doesn't matter. Um, now you're building up these other people. Now you're getting into leadership again, which is this idea of building up the people around you and working smarter not harder in that sense and having that work-life balance and building those relationships and everything we talked about today and any last final words uh you mentioned a couple of books raving fans uh the fish market um you know any 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 closing comments anything that you want people to 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 know or to know about you no it's good to say i love the entrepreneurship we never really talked about that in this podcast today but i love the entrepreneurship entrepreneurship on taking chances doing stuff like that you know the one thing with the two books i get my uh, employees to read is raving fans because there's it's a nice story uh about a customer experience and there's six different experiences that they go through which is a fairy godmother i don't want to talk too much about the book but all my branch managers all my business development managers my, my customer service representative i make them read that book because if you read that book and they're happy it's, it's amazing the other book another client branch is who moved my cheese uh, it's a great book. Just talk. It's a small little book. It's nothing. It takes no time to read, uh, but just talks about business and how you're going to do. Uh, that's what I use for a lot of my sales guys because there's, you know, there's four characters. Two of the characters want to stay back. Well, this isn't fair. This is not fair. This is, they did treat me right. I'm not going to change. This is going to come back. It was never like this. And you got the two other people. They're going looking at different ideas and how they're going to do it. So actually, we have a business meeting with all my branch managers and business mail managers on um, two or sorry on Wednesday and Thursday this week and part of the discussion is going to talk about that book and do that stuff again you always have to be adapt for change you always got to take risks um, and learn from your mistakes if there's anything to say once you make a decision do it if it was a good mistake yeah things are good everybody gets a high five pat in the back whatever if it's a bad one don't go name calling okay that wasn't good don't do that again. Let's carry on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's fun. Yeah, exactly. It's an awesome thing to do. And, you know, I love doing stuff like this as far as helping people. Look, like, even talking to the kids in the warehouse, you know, a lot of guys back in the warehouse I see daily, uh, they're in their, you know, mid twenties. They want to get a, a PlayStation five or buy a car. I'm like, guys, save your money, save your money, save your money, get equity, buy a, um, a townhouse, buy a condo, buy something that has some equity in it, and that way you get that going. Then once you get that, you can buy as many PlayStations as you want. You can buy a TV, whatever you want, but get that equity. So I love trying to help the younger kids doing it because the more younger kids you help out, is going to be tough. Everyone says now the price of houses. You know, we just live in Orangeville for a detached in a house in Orangeville. You're probably eight hundred grand before COVID. It was about four hundred grand. Oh my God, how can I afford to buy that house? I can never do it. Well. My parents did the same thing when they bought their house for, I think, $13,000. How am I going to afford this? I bought my first house for one hundred and ten. dollars How are you ever going to afford it? So it's the same thing, but I don't know. But I love doing stuff. If I can help out in any way for the, the generations of the new kids coming up or any other stuff, no, anything I do to help you out, Kyle, I've known you for a long time. I've known your family for any stuff I, or a long time. So if there's anything that I can do, please let me know. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, for anybody who wants to buy a set of tires and, and they live in Canada, it's the Tire Discounter Group is is what you're affiliated with. Go to one of those branches, but um, and and you'll get that uh, customer experience. Yeah, I've known you a long time, uh, Frank, and I appreciate you jumping on here. Uh, I'm sure we'll do this again because I feel like every time we have a conversation, we just get uh, going down a different rabbit hole on you know leadership, entrepreneurship. Um, you know, this is all great stuff. We're just sharing our perspectives. Uh, hopefully this helps somebody. I'm sure it will. And uh, for anybody listening, uh, you know, pass this on to somebody who who uh, you think might f- find some value in this. And and then uh, together, we'll just work together and keep building this positive environment and change the world that way. So awesome. until next time, thanks again, Frank. And we'll, uh, we'll see everybody on next week's episode. All right, I appreciate you, Kyle. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for listening to this episode of Captain's Mindset Podcast. We hope you found value in our discussion of leadership and personal development. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing and leaving us a review. Your feedback helps us improve the show and reach more listeners. Remember, everyone has the potential to be a leader in their own life. Keep working on developing a captain's mindset and leading with purpose and intention. Join us next time for more insights and tips on how to become the best version of yourself. And until then, keep navigating through the ups and downs of your life with a captain's mindset and always steer towards becoming the best version of yourself. Become the captain of your own life.